prostitution, organ trafficking, drugs, cigarettes, toxic waste, pharmaceuticals, arms. Not to mention corruption, tax evasion, money laundering, terrorism. The globalization of our economy means crime is going truly international. And the digital revolution has brought us cybercrime. There's only one international organization that brings together police from five continents. It's called Interpol, and its task is to lead the battle against all these forms of criminality. In 1914, the first International Criminal Police Congress was held in Monaco. 24 countries laid down the founding principles of international police cooperation. The concept of Interpol was born. A hundred years later, it's a respected and prestigious organization. But what do we really know about it? Yeah, meet. Interpol has its own myth, and that's quite useful. I never destroy a good myth. In reality, there isn't such a thing as an Interpol detective dashing over rooftops and, and arresting people a la Tom Cruise. The reality is uh, far more mechanical and complex. Interpol has a mission, although it's not much like the myth. It's to coordinate the exchange of information between the police forces of its 192 member countries. But with so many different states involved, some more democratic than others and often with different interests, an international police organization can be hard to coordinate. There is no risk of that happening. Interpol suffers from a budget that's totally insufficient for what it wants to do. So in 2011, it launched financial partnerships with various multinationals, institutions, and governments. This begs the question of how those funds are used. But if the organization has to police itself, how can it maintain its integrity and avoid any conflicts of interest? Mrs. Ward. Uh, I think we all agree that Interpol and police cooperation across borders are extremely important for our security. However, when the Interpol system is abused by undemocratic regimes to silence and persecute legitimate voices and human rights defenders, we must all be deeply concerned. Interpol cannot be a state within a state. There has to be some monitoring. Whatever it does, it has to respect fundamental freedoms and personal data. If there are abuses of Interpol's system, it is for Interpol to put in place the necessary measures to prevent such abuse of its procedures. Deviation, manipulation, abuse. The European Parliament has taken up the debate on the red notices, alerts issued by Interpol following the recent questioning of Dogan Akanli, a German writer of Turkish origin arrested by the Spanish police in August 2017. His arrest resulted from an Interpol red notice requested by Ankara. Dogan Akanli is known mainly for his views on the Armenian genocide and the issue of Kurdish rights. Connecting police for a safer world. That's Interpol's motto. And at the heart of police cooperation, as well as all the fuss surrounding it, are those red notices. They're what's brought Interpol all its notoriety. When a country has individuals who belong to either terrorist or criminal organizations, it provides us with their identity, photos, fingerprints, etc. So from the moment the notice is issued, it's seen by 190 member countries. And that means that individual can be picked up in a routine check anywhere in the world. Notices come in eight different colors, but the red ones are the best known. As soon as a member country signals up a criminal, an offense, an escape, a threat, Interpol puts out a red notice. It's an alert that can set in motion a worldwide manhunt. Red notices are a tried and tested tool, but there are five times more of them going out now than there were 10 years ago. 2,343 in 2005 compared to 12,787 in 2016. 
Is this something we should be worried about? Last year, we put out about 10,000 requests, red notices, wanted notices. One to two percent of them were contested. One to two percent. That represents tens, hundreds even, of arrest warrants. Although Article 3 of Interpol's constitution, referred to as the Neutrality Clause, stipulates, it is strictly forbidden for the organization to undertake any intervention or activities of a political, military, religious, or racial character. Budgetary sanctions are maybe the best to block these countries from misusing the red notice. I suggested, for example, that countries should pay for the increased costs they produce with their abusing of the system. That's one of the uh, positions we had. Interpol must increase the number of personnel, the number of staff to make more serious investigations on all these issues. Sanctioning the misusers could well be a solution. Interpol's financial problems are a well-known fact. It may well be the second largest international organization after the United Nations, but its budget doesn't at all match its renown. The combined contributions of all 192 member countries come to hardly more than 50 million euros. By comparison, the FBI's budget is more than 7 billion. That's 60 times more than Interpol's budget. So right now, Interpol's in a budget deficit. We've reduced uh, our operating budget, we've reduced our travel budget, and we've frozen um, new hires, essentially. Since I've joined, we've hired three people. Um, so it's been pretty tough. And that's been a big change, because I don't think Interpol has ever had to operate in a reduced budget environment uh, ever before in its history. So it's up to Jürgen Stock, Interpol's Secretary General elected in late 2014, to enforce the new regime of austerity. It's quite a challenge to take on an institution whose predecessor dreamt of an omnipresent, inescapable and indispensable organization with a budget to match. Gaining your trust, the trust of my staff, and acting in the best interest of the organization have been my number one priority as your Secretary General. Ronald Noble spent 14 years at the head of Interpol. He arrived at Lyon in France in late 2000 and would turn the place upside down. Would be devoted. And the great upheaval began on September the 11th, 2001. Ronald Noble had been director of Interpol for less than a year. On September 11th happened, no one called us. No one called us for assistance. No one called us to alert us that these terrorist attacks had occurred. I found out about it from my brother. After September 11th, we went operational, helped the U.S. Um, exchange information, and decided that the lights would never again be turned out off at Interpol. 9-11 was really the, uh, the quintessential moment for Interpol, where Interpol realized that it was excluded from any consideration of support during the, uh, the terrorist attacks in the US. The scale and the loss of life, I think, really rammed home to policymakers and law enforcement leaders around the world that you have to think differently if you're going to be successful. We must remember that Interpol's vision is to connect police. Over the next 10 years, Ronald Noble entirely overhauled Interpol's working methods, communications, and mission statements. About a suspect or a victim. He was pleased with his reforms and not shy about letting people know it. A command and coordination center was open to provide round-the-clock support to member countries, while a global communication system called I-24-7 allowed police to exchange messages securely and to access Interpol's databases in real time. These innovations were pricey. 
Ronald Noble increased Interpol's staff from 380 to 800. But his budget didn't get any bigger. So the Secretary General pulled out all the stops to obtain the financing he needed for all those missions he had planned. This is global organized crime and crime, uh, counter crime activities. These are massive tasks and you give it 50 million euros to operate globally? I mean, governments ought to be ashamed of themselves. All governments, including France, which is the host of Interpol. You know, Australia, the USA, they, they fund this tiny organization and give it a mandate to support police around the world, to fight organized crime and terrorism. I mean, it's almost so silly, it's a joke. In October 2008, Interpol's 77th General Assembly was held in St. Petersburg. In his opening speech, Ronald Noble called out then Prime Minister Vladimir Putin. Mr. Prime Minister, I beseech you personally and all heads of state and government for Interpol's 187 member countries to act swiftly and decisively in supporting Interpol's global security initiative for the 21st century and the creation of a billion euro fund to support Interpol's efforts to further... 15 times his budget, a huge sum yet so small compared to the hundreds of billions of dollars of government handouts to mop up after the financial crisis, as Noble wasn't slow to point out. In other words, I urge that the global struggle against terrorism and serious international crime be approached with the same passion and scope of commitment as nations around the world are demonstrating in solving the economic crisis currently confronting us. What's your current budget? 70 million euros. Oh dear. It's not a lot, is it? You said to me, you remember? A billion. You said I got you in want... trouble for it. Are you prepared to say now you still want a billion? I still want a billion. And I still believe it should be a billion. And I believe it's easy to defend. Who's stopping you getting a billion? Our member countries. Our member countries are prepared to spend billions and tens of billions and hundreds of billions of dollars in war and other ways to try to make the world safer and not spend a fraction of that to try to prevent crime. And if it seemed obvious that only international cooperation could stand up to an international threat, then why were the member countries, or at least the richest among them, not more inclined to finance Interpol? They are the ones. The challenge we face is that those member dues, the 52 million, is largely comes from the police force's own budgets. These normally do not come from the governments per se, but out of the police forces' statutory budgets. Around the world, police forces, uh, a lot of them have faced big cuts in recent years. Um, global austerity has mean there's just not as much money to go around. That's the reality. But was a lack of cash the only explanation for member countries' reluctance to contribute? One thing can't be overlooked. It's a problem with any supranational institution, the loss of sovereignty. What's the point of financing an institution set up to coordinate the exchange of information and create a vast database if you're convinced that sharing that information could be a danger to national security? How can you be sure your particular data won't fall into the wrong hands? When you see that in many national DNA databases there are literally millions of profiles, but in Interpols there are only less than 200,000, then you can see there's a real problem with sharing on an international level. The basis of international police cooperation is reciprocity. Uh, you can't, it's very difficult if one police force says, I will just collect from all the other police forces around the world, but not share anything when requested. If too many countries took that position, there wouldn't be international police cooperation. In 2010, Ronald Noble was re-elected with an overwhelming majority for a third term as head of Interpol. He knew it would be his last and would do his utmost to approach that figure of one billion that he was still demanding. On failing that over many years of trying, he then moved logically into private public partnerships for an alternative method of achieving the sorts of funding base that Interpol needed. Public-private partnerships, or PPPs, were all the rage. 
a solution that was being strongly encouraged by both the World Bank and the European Investment Bank. Between 2010 and 2015, while member countries' contributions only increased by 6.5%, private investment was climbing to dizzying heights, by as much as 750%, in fact. When it's private money involved in any form of investigation, I think that presents a threat to the independence of justice. Who are we dealing with? What kind of company is it? What are the goals of this company or federation? How can we be sure you're working completely independently and without any favoritism? While Interpol's reputation and reliability are crucial for all member states, it is our strong belief that the activities concerning public-private partnerships should always be compatible with the principles, aims, and activities of Interpol. It was a real warning shot, a dressing down for the head of Interpol, and not by just anybody. The letter bore the signatures of quite a few European police chiefs, Germany, Holland, Austria, Belgium, Denmark, Finland, Luxembourg, Norway, Sweden. Since June 2012, everyone had been worried about conflicts of interest and even about interference with some of Interpol's mission partners. From Germany's point of view, the private sector has always been a particularly sensitive point. You have to really make sure it's not the money that's choosing the projects, but rather the projects that determine what funds are needed. This distrust had begun a year earlier with a first partnership. That was to prove, to say the least, explosive, with FIFA, the International Federation of Football Association. Chris Eaton was the key player in this project. He's Australian and was 58 years old when he left Interpol, where he'd been director of the Command and Coordination Center, a vital part of the organization. It was an eminent post, but one that he readily dropped to become head of security at FIFA. His mission now was to look into the ever-growing problem of match fixing. But the reality is that uh, most of the gambling houses uh, that are being uh, uh, ripped off by these criminals are on the big matches because they gamble on big international friendlies, big competitions. This is where the big pot of money is gambled and where the biggest windfalls can come from criminals. To understand how it all happened, you have to go back to 2010, 2011, to the time when what they call match fixing was starting to become a major problem. If fans couldn't be sure anymore if it was a real match, football lost all its meaning. No one would go to the stadiums anymore, and that's why everyone suddenly wanted to sort this problem out. Especially FIFA, who got their main revenues from TV broadcasting rights. And match fixing leads to less supporters at the games, less TV viewers, so less broadcasting rights. Let's not forget the turnover. From the World Cup games alone, almost a billion euros for the 2010 South Africa World Cup, more than three billion euros for Brazil 2014. I then negotiated with uh, Ron Noble and, uh, and uh, with the Jerome Velp to have FIFA invest in Interpol because it was clear to me that it needed the police input as to make the anti-match fixing, fixing effort uh, more, uh, more effective. You met Ron Noble? No, no, no. no. On the 9th of May 2011, Chris Eaton welcomed Ronald Noble at FIFA headquarters to celebrate the marriage of the International Criminal Police Organization and the International Federation of the most popular sport in the world with a dowry of 20 million euros over 10 years. At the time, everyone was surprised. I myself thought, Interpol? Interpol had never really interested me. And it happened at the very moment President Blatter and FIFA were being attacked from all sides. Everyone's been waiting for England. The recent British media campaign about rumors of corruption surrounding some FIFA members has crushed English hopes. 
This matter, and many others besides, hit the news six months before the partnership was signed and wasn't raised by either a police force or an intelligence agency. And the jackpot goes to? Is Qatar. It's the big surprise of the day, although the Qatari's bid wasn't the worst rated of the lot. How could the International Criminal Police Organization sign up to a partnership with an institution that was already under so much suspicion? How could they claim not to know? That's something I could never understand. It didn't seem possible that I knew more than Noble himself. It was ridiculous. He must have known. And the agreement will now be signed by the FIFA president and the Secretary General of Interpol. The signing was just three weeks before the 61st FIFA Congress. Sepp Blatter was seeking a fourth term as president of the International Federation. And of course, appearing in public with the Secretary General of Interpol at that particular moment was a gift from the gods. He's there and he's staying. Today, Sepp Blatter was re-elected president of FIFA despite objections from England that were squashed at the last moment. Suspicions of corruption surrounding the hosting of the 2022 World Cup and divisions within the institution itself. So Sepp Blatter was re-elected. Over the following months and years, the stories of scandals at FIFA were to snowball. But we'll come to that. The partnership provided an air of integrity as well as re-election. And 20 million to fight match fixing and hang on to several billion in funds from those TV rights. And, um and at the presentation of the contract with Ron Noble, Seb Blatter said this wonderful thing that I find very revealing. Who knows? This might become the intelligence wing of FIFA. And Ron Noble, the future intelligence chief of FIFA, was sitting right beside him and said nothing. Intrigue, doubts, speculation. But the question remained, how could a private partnership simply invest millions for no return? When, for example, Philip Morris International invested 15 million in the fight against cigarette smuggling, did the world's leading tobacco manufacturer have other interests in mind apart from stopping the trafficking that was damaging its profits and which it had already been speaking out against? Tobacco traffickers are the third largest global cigarette suppliers, trading around 600 billion illegal cigarettes every year. This means that legal manufacturers and retailers are losing sales, while governments and taxpayers are being robbed 40 to $50 billion annually, money that could be funding important public services and helping local communities. By working together, the legal industry law enforcement, governments, and civil society, we can stop the illegal cigarette trade. Together, we can stop illegal cigarettes. A very convincing pitch from Philip Morris. Everything society could achieve, all the good things our kids could have, if it wasn't for cigarette smuggling. So why then did the World Health Organization see red when this partnership was announced, to the point of refusing Interpol observer status at their conference on tobacco control? Over the course of the last 15 years, the tobacco industry has managed to convince governments around the world, international agencies like Interpol, even OLAF, uh, potentially, that rather than being this pariah supplier of an illicit product, actually it's a victim of the illicit tobacco trade and part of the solution. But nothing could be further from the truth. How could Interpol and its Secretary General have signed an agreement with Philip Morris, knowing that going back to 1989, there are 80 million documents that testify to all the misdeeds of the tobacco industry? They show that the industry hasn't respected the law and that it has knowingly collaborated with criminal organizations. We think that's a big question. To get an idea of just how incongruous this partnership was, just remember that in the heyday of the Montenegro connection, the tobacco industry was actually cooperating with the Italian and the Balkan Mafia to supply contraband. So much so, 
that in 2004, Philip Morris International agreed to pay $1.25 billion to the European community to avoid being taken to court. At the press conference after the signing, Le Monde journalist Philippe Ricard challenged Philip Morris International boss André Kalanzopoulos about it. Uh, could you tell us, now you've got nothing more to fear from the courts, if Philip Morris was in the recent past implicated in the smuggling of authentic products? Um, you know, all these allegations were part of the litigation that was going ongoing between us and the European Union. And as I said, we can all have our own views on the merit of this case. The actual fact is that we decided to put it behind us. And that's, uh, this is an agreement about looking forward. And I think it's a unique agreement by its nature. And that's the most important thing. Okay. But what was in it for manufacturers who supplied the contraband trade with their own products? First of all, cigarettes that are smuggled are way, way cheaper because they have no taxes on them. The cheaper they are, the more they sell. And in particular, the more they sell to young people. And the tobacco industry's documents also make clear that they understand that it's really important to have cheap cigarettes available for young people, because otherwise, they wouldn't take up this deadly habit. In total, Philip Morris International and three other tobacco giants would pay the European Union over 2 billion euros. With this agreement, OLAF, the European Anti-Fraud Office, Customs, the EU, and the tobacco industry could cooperate in the fight against cigarette smuggling. But when it comes to cigarette smuggling, there are three categories. Counterfeit cigarettes, often of poor quality, real cigarettes, but stolen or fallen off a truck, and cheap whites, also known as illicit whites, which are cigarettes produced legally in one country to be sold on the black market of another. And the whole thing is to know which of these types of trafficking this agreement between Interpol and Philip Morris International was aimed at. This deal is really just about addressing counterfeit. And counterfeit it is just one element of the illicit cigarette trade. And it's the smallest element. There's a far bigger problem with the tobacco company's products ending up in the illicit market. They're putting money into Interpol, so Interpol can speak about the illicit tobacco trade and represent issues on the illicit tobacco trade that the tobacco companies want to see represented. All the information we have concerning the trafficking comes entirely and directly from the tobacco industry. This, of course, makes the matter more complicated. I mean, that a dubious symbiosis has occurred between the tobacco industry and the state. The tobacco companies had taken control of the fight against cigarette smuggling, that illegal trade that was hurting their profits and that they had, economically, every interest in combating. Montenegro, Kosovo, Serbia, Italy. Today, the trafficking continues. And it's because of this passive cooperation that Interpol was refused the status of passive observer of HWO's anti-tobacco convention. Every partnership is unique. Interpol may well be involved in an active partnership. But what if that partnership is meant not just to distort or influence reality, but to eliminate the competition, the competition on which millions of lives depend? Hey, my brothers and sisters, we have a big problem here. It's time for you to kick the habits about bad medicines as deadly weapons that are killing off our citizens, killing off our women and men. This awareness video is part of Interpol's campaign against counterfeit drugs, 
and to polish the Interpol myth. Sanofi, France's leading pharmaceutical company, announced these figures. One out of 10 medicines sold in the world was counterfeit. It was world's most lucrative business, well ahead of either prostitution or marijuana. In 2014, counterfeit medicine represented a $200 billion market. Reason enough to fight back against this organized crime. Your fake medicines can be completely ineffective, or even very dangerous. Who could possibly object to a collaboration that aimed to eradicate a trade responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths a year? It's a pretty complex struggle. Interpol's attitude has been to discredit some medicines. They use arguments that are completely false. Because, from a health point of view, all we need is for a medicine to work. At the root of this confrontation were patents that granted companies a 20-year monopoly and all the profits, only, however, in the country where the patents were registered and recognized. Elsewhere, anyone could completely legally manufacture, sell, or consume their generics. Generic medicines are legally authorized medicines, and they save lives, because they're the same product as the original medicine. Fake medicines, though, are unregulated, and there's no guarantee they contain the correct dosage of their active substance, and that's if they're not actually poisonous. While generic medicines are supervised, and they save lives. All the same, from the point of view of the pharmaceutical labs, generics are the competition and they'd like to get rid of them if they could. On November 10, 2011, Ronald Noble was in Madrid. The press weren't informed of his visit, which seemed strange for this veteran media operator. He was meeting there in Madrid with members of the Dalder Group. This organization brought together no less than 29 of the world's biggest pharmaceutical companies. And the head of Interpol ended his speech with these words. Interpol understands the sensitivity of your struggle against the threat posed by the global trafficking of counterfeit pharmaceutical products. The organization I have the honor to lead is capable of leveraging your resources to develop a multi-pronged strategy that will protect both your corporate interests and the security of millions around the world. And that's where Interpol's mission gets a little fuzzy. Do protecting the security of millions of people and protecting the interests of the pharmaceutical industry really go together? Does Interpol make the distinction between counterfeit drugs and generic drugs? Is it fighting counterfeiting in order to save lives or to protect the financial interests of Big Pharma at the risk of depriving a whole section of the population of medicines? This patent war would come to a head in India. Paul also came here, met with us, and uh, in the man of my discussion, uh, they said that look, but all that you are selling in India is counterfeit. So I said, beg your pardon, can you explain to me? Because Indian law, these products are not under patent, and what we are selling is not counterfeit. What we are selling is genuine, generic medicines. India had its own legalization. It bypassed certain patents, so it didn't have to wait 20 years to start producing its own generics. The medicines produced in India were among the cheapest in the world, and it was one of the rare countries with all the facilities necessary to manufacture large quantities of high-quality generic medicines.
Indian generic companies uh, plays a major role in facilitating access to medicine, especially in uh, developing countries. To be more precise, 92% of the uh, uh, HIV AIDS medicines uh, are coming from India, uh, which, which now supports the global HIV AIDS free treatment program, supports around 15 million uh, patients. 84% of the MSF medicine needs are coming from or uh, medicines are purchased from India. In any case, Ronald Noble sealed the partnership with Big Pharma in March 2013. 4.5 million euros over three years. Interpol as an agency uh, is, is not free from the international human rights obligations. By uh, accepting these financial resources and working on behalf of the uh, huge uh, pharmaceutical transnational corporations, which have a dubious role in, uh, in, in uh, compromising the access to affordable medical care all over the world. It will soon be called a crime. Because it is indeed a criminal act in the sense that people are dying in some countries and a very expensive medicine blocks treatment and can cause people's deaths. You know, people are self-medicating, um, still buying those products. How about cardiovascular? It may be hard to deny the effectiveness of some campaigns, such as this one against the sale of illicit drugs online. But in the autumn of 2016, Jürgen Stock announced that Interpol would not be renewing its partnership with the pharmaceutical industry. We came to a mutual agreement that we wished to continue this cooperation, but that Interpol would no longer accept any money, any further money from the pharmaceutical industry. What's important is that it should be the police authorities who call the shots, and that their independence and neutrality should not be in question. And it's important that there should be no conflicts of interest. So what can we read between the lines? That Interpol had lost its grip on the fight against fake medicines? Secret discussions between big pharma companies nowadays are all about extending the lives of their patents. Each additional year brings in billions. Thank you, Dean when it comes to lobbying, Philip Morris seems to have met its match. Many involved in the fight against cigarette smuggling, including the WHO, were advocating traceable codes which would enable a pack of cigarettes to be tracked and its export mapped to make sure it didn't escape being taxed. Interpol's choice was clear. Codentify, a 12-number code on cigarette packs. Ronald Noble ran with the idea by promoting it at various international conferences. He even promised he'd make it a part of some of Interpol's databases. This couldn't offend anybody, if it wasn't for the fact that the tracing system was developed by Philip Morris International. It may have been sailing a new flag and have been rebaptized in Exto, but it could still plunge Interpol into a fresh conflict of interests. It puts the tobacco industry, which has been massively involved in cigarette smuggling, in control of a system that seeks to provide a solution to cigarette smuggling. And here's what the WHO had to say about Codentify. Imagine you're a farmer and that your chickens are disappearing. You are approached by a fox who offers you a high-tech tracking system so you can trace the chickens and find out who is stealing them. In 2016, Philip Morris sold, legally, 813 billion cigarettes, representing revenues of 71 billion euros. 15 million over three years, or 5 million a year. That was the price of its partnership with Interpol, an ally that had, at the time of the signature, 190 member countries. Ronald Noble has always denied lobbying. For the anti-tobacco department of the WHO, 
the conflict of interest had never been in doubt. Jurgen Stock would see this partnership out but not renew it. Same thing with the pharmaceutical industry. The agreement with FIFA, however, was to run until 2021. It came to a very colorful end, and not without consequences. Now, why does match fixing spread so thoroughly throughout the world? We By 2015, Interpol and FIFA had been happily married for four years. In May of that year, all the FIFA top management got together in Congress in Zurich to elect their new president. Sepp Blatter, then 79 years old, was hoping for a fifth term. But three days before the vote, in the center of Zurich, Swiss police questioned one by one several directors of FIFA, the International Football Federation. The police arrived at dawn at the hotel where Federation leaders were preparing to elect their new president on Friday. Among those interviewed were Jeffrey Webb of the Cayman Islands and Eugenio Figueredo from Uruguay, both members of the executive committee and Jack Warner of Trinidad and Tobago. The arrest couldn't have happened in a better place. The most expensive hotel in one of the most expensive towns in the world. And at six o'clock, there was a knock on the door. No, no, I haven't ordered breakfast. You don't order breakfast, get your clothes on. No, no, go away, go away. I've still got Gloria with me. Get your clothes on, sir. And so it proceeded. And uh, within an hour or so, these absolutely astounded. FIFA were misled by the deal with the, with the Interpol because they thought there would be no attention given to their crime and they could go on committing them. But what I knew and what they didn't know was that the FBI were long by the time stuck into FIFA, just doing the donkey work, the shovel work, document after document. Was Interpol behind these arrests? The answer is an unambiguous no. The interrogations were the fruit of a bilateral exchange between the Swiss police and the American FBI. But here's the irony of it. Interpol has just issued six arrest warrants for other members of FIFA. Clearly, the organization was put in a position where we were handling red notices for some of the uh, executives and former executives of who we had a partnership agreement with. And even if you're short of money, that's no excuse for acting stupidly. And if you ask me, an association with FIFA was stupid. It's a little complicated, but it's true some countries were very reticent at the start. As for me, well, I'm French, and it's true that we don't really lead the field when it comes to public-private partnerships. We're learning, but we're still a bit doubtful. That's just how we are in France. Germany, too. It's no problem for you English and Americans, so. So we tend to say, OK, but what about this and what about that, until we end up saying, that's enough. We've seen enough to know we have to stop this right here because it may well be putting the organization's reputation at risk. The organization's reputation. With a partnership like this, how could one not cast doubt on Interpol's avowed intention to fight corruption? In September 2015, four months after putting an end to the partnership with FIFA, Jürgen Stock, for the first time, set up an ethics committee. We brought in an external advisory service with experts from the police, from other international organizations, as well as scientists and people from Transparency International, who all helped us to write the rule book. Once I'd taken my post here in Lyon, we decided we wouldn't accept any money from the alcohol industry, the sex industry, the tobacco industry, or the arms industry. And on this new ethics committee, a new post was created, that of due diligence officer. It was up to this person to judge whether it was ethical for Interpol to enter into a partnership or not. 
We noticed that the bigger a company is, the more problems it has. So the question for us at Interpol is, do we want to exclude entire sectors such as pharmaceuticals, such as banks, or Google, or whoever? Because we know that all big companies have some kind of problem somewhere. On the business side, everything seemed fine. But there were still a few matters that could cause fresh problems for the organization. And this time, at Interpol's 81st General Assembly in Rome in 2012, exactly 18 months after signing the partnership with FIFA, Interpol got involved with a state, that of Qatar. $10 million to reinforce security and safety at all the big sporting fixtures over the coming 10 years, culminating in the dreaded Qatar 2022 World Cup. They'd ended the partnership with FIFA. So why were they now taking on Qatar? Had the Interpol Ethics Committee looked into it? First of all, it is important to point out that I carry out assessments on money that comes from the private sector. If it's from Qatar, it's public. So you make no inquiries? No. Even if there's suspected corruption? I do not perform due diligence on member states or governments. No inquiry into member states with whom Interpol signs partnerships and initiatives that could raise a few eyebrows. At a time when the whole of Europe was coming down on tax evasion, Ronald Noble, in 2013, created a foundation in Geneva. Interpol's Foundation for a Safer World. Its aim, to raise funds for the organization. And for that, you can't beat a prestigious administrative council. He had such figures as Sheikh Mansour, Deputy Prime Minister of the United Arab Emirates, Khan Seng Wong, former Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore, Elias Moore, a Lebanese former minister, Carlos Ghazna, Renault Nissan CEO, and Prince Albert II of Monaco himself. When you look at the members of the board of the foundation, there's some very influential, highly experienced and high caliber individuals on that board. And to have access to that talent can't hurt Interpol at all. In fact, it can only benefit Interpol ultimately. Trust and confidence in HSBC. Uh, when we started this inquiry, Stuart Gulliver, group chief executive of the English bank HSBC, was a member of Interpol's administrative council. Why you felt the need as a Hong Kong domiciled person to create a Panamanian company? Right. First of all, there was no tax advantage or purpose whatsoever to the Panamanian company. As a matter of fact, there was no tax purpose to it. It was a Panamanian nominee entity constructed well, purely to give me privacy. Create. Purely to give me privacy within my own company. You do understand how this looks today, <coughs> do you? I understand that it looks puzzling to people, and I understand it looks... Um, and, and, and it looks difficult and suggests that there might have been other reasons related to tax, but there were not. I have been UK tax resident since 2003. Incredible. Incredible. This hearing in front of the Treasury Select Committee of the British Parliament gave rise to an article in The Guardian. The paper accused Gulliver of having a secret $7 million account at HSBC Switzerland in the name of a Panamanian company. I read about it in the papers like everyone else. I contacted the president. We expressed our concern about these accusations being made in the public domain. The board discussed it. To our knowledge, all necessary decisions were taken. Indeed, Interpol did ask the foundation to suspend Stuart Gulliver in February 2015 following the Guardian article. But the director of HSBC didn't actually lose his job until 18 months later, while we were already looking into all this. A coincidence? In any case, he was simply replaced by the man sitting next to him here, Douglas Flint, chairman of the same bank.
It's a private entity that in itself has nothing to do with Interpol. Yes, it's the Interpol Foundation created to make money for Interpol, but it's an entity. Fine. The Interpol Foundation is a totally independent entity, and Interpol's ethics committee doesn't do any audits on member states. In March 2017, the United Arab Emirates gave the foundation 50 million euros. When the foundation receives from a member state a donation more or less equivalent to the total contributions of all 192 members, surely that begs questions about the organization's independence. Unity for security. We have a rule at the organization that we don't want any one state to be too dominant when it comes to supplementary donations. That means there's a defined limit written into our rules. However, this donation we received for the Interpol Foundation from the United Arab Emirates was below this limit. So they set the bar pretty high. But let's not forget that Sheikh Mansour of the Emirates is a member of the foundation's administrative council. Even though his busy schedule doesn't leave him much time for it. Deputy prime minister, director of an oil company, member of various administrative councils in both oil and water. Plus, he's also heavily invested in media and owns several football clubs, including Manchester City. Thanks to the foundation, the United Arab Emirates have become one of the leading state contributors to Interpol. Never forget that an international organization is made up of its member countries. And if it doesn't work, it's the fault of those members. These partnerships all leave a bitter taste, all the more so when you think that we're dealing here with amounts that the member countries could all easily afford if they wanted to. And if they don't, it's because they don't think its missions are that useful. What can we do so that multinationals, who regularly avoid both the taxman and the courts and continue to bleed us all dry, be made to finance our own institutions instead?